I choose to remain anonymous because um, I'm afraid of potential retributory actions by my previous phone. And I'm currently still on job search, so just to be on the safe side. I signed an NDA before I left the company and I'm afraid of the repercussions if I was identified. It happens again. We can take something positive out of it, we can move on with it. That's why I decided to come on the show. I was very unfairly retrenched and I wanted to share more about companies who are irresponsibly retrenching people. It's definitely not personal. It's business cycle. It sounds very harsh, but it is what it is. There's a stigma that if you are laid off, it means that you perform badly, but that is not true. Did you expect yourself to be laid off? Definitely not. No. No, no. Welcome to a special one-hour forum of Talking Point. We are coming to you live today. Over 14,000 workers were laid off last year, the highest in three years. No one is spared. From the young to the old, fresh graduates to senior employees. And experts are warning that this is just the start. Meta, Amazon, Google, Shopee and Lazada. These are just some of the companies behind the numbers you had seen earlier. Now, some of you may be wondering, Am I next? Well, tonight I'm speaking to industry insiders and people directly affected to tell you everything you need to know about what really goes on behind layoffs. Here are my guests. Now, uh, you saw one of them in the video earlier opening the show and now Karen, not her real name, joins us live. We also have someone who has carried out retrenchments in the course of his work. Because he will be revealing insider secrets, he has asked to also remain anonymous. Uh, and now, Grace, let's start with you. Why have you... You were retrenched in July last year. Why have you decided not to conceal your identity? Well, I believe that retrenchment is nothing to be ashamed about. I believe that by coming to this show and by sharing my story, I hope I can empower people who are experiencing the same problem as me. Did you ever feel ashamed that you were retrenched? At first, yes. But after um, uh, having some personal reflect, reflection, I do believe that it's nothing to be embarrassed about because it wasn't that I was performing badly. Mm -hmm. It was it's just business and it is what it is. Why did you feel ashamed very quickly? Why did you feel ashamed initially? It was just the stigma of uh, being retrenched. We always heard that it's such a bad thing to uh, happen to us. So it's more like uh, the stigma that I've led to believe for so long. Mm. Yeah. Okay, you mentioned the word stigma. We'll talk more about that later on. Now, earlier on, I asked uh, Grace as well as Karen to show me what exactly was said to them when they were told that they were retrenched. I also wanted them to write down what hurt the most. Let's reveal what they have written. Uh, Grace, let's take a look at yours first. Let's see now. It says, not expected at all. Uh, promised increment just a few weeks before you were given the news. So needless to say, it came as a shock to you. Yes, it was very shocking as uh, we were promised an increment, uh, not just me, all of my colleagues were getting retrenched as well. So naturally, we thought that the company was doing okay and we were still going to be in the same job for at least six more months. Do you think that they meant it when they told you that or it was something to throw you off? I think they meant it, but after further thinking, uh, they decided that uh, they needed to cut costs fast and they had to react fast after. That is really interesting, to cut cost fast. Mm. Uh, Karen, let's go over to you and see what you have written on your board. Uh, okay, so I wrote that during the process of letting me know, mm. the manager uh, was very obviously reading from a script and then there was really no compassion. So he really wanted to finish me off quick and go on to the next one. Why did that hurt you? Mm, I feel that I was just another number on their spreadsheet to cut off and they had no thoughts about uh, what, how I felt or uh, what are some of the things that I struggle with. Mm. Mm. Just another number. John, let me come to you now. As an HR practitioner, you've been directly involved in retrenchment exercises. Are they just another number? Take me through the motions. What usually happens? Yeah, obviously not just another number because we are really dealing with people here. 
if think of that is that any responsible companies, right, wouldn't want to do a retrenchment unless it's a last resort. That is what they are supposed to do, do the, uh, the, the, the cost cutting as a last resort. But hearing from Grace earlier on, it seemed really last minute. Would you think, Grace, would you agree that it was a last resort? It was not a last resort. It was kind of like a last minute decision, I believe. Okay, uh, John, can I get back to you to tell me a little bit more about uh, what happens, what usually happens when a company decides to go through a retrenchment exercise? For example, is it via phone call, face-to-face, -face, Zoom, what happens? Or oh, it all depends on the number of people impacted. So ideally, if it's a company that is actually a few people, it's always recommended to ensure that you do a face-to-face. -face. However, during the COVID stage, when the employee were impacted, this is where the Zoom notification was done. Of recent, when you actually noticed that when companies started to retrench a lot more people, this is where email notification also started to surface. John, you have been through five, at least five, retrenchment exercises. How emotional do people get? I've heard stories that even security personnel had to be called in. Yeah, it's actually a very emotional and psychologically draining process. In my experience itself, right, um, every, every individual that we have to notify can actually react very differently. What? But indeed, it's a very emotional process. Uh, Jeremy, let's come to you now. I know that you've been involved in some retrenchment exercises as well. Tell me through, take me through what happens. So, you know, what really happens is that right now we are in a super cycle where interest rates are high. And so for technology companies that are, as a result, disproportionately impacted by this, everybody is kind of really seeing what the weather forecast is, not just for this year, but for the next five years ahead. And so companies are working with their boards to basically say, what do we need to do differently? Because our assumptions, our forecasts that we had made years ago, that we had promises that we had made to our shareholders, um, are not going to be easily delivered. And so this becomes a consultative process between the founder and the CEO and the executive team, mm. as well as the board about, for example, what the budget is going to be. And so a big part of the budget, as you imagine, is comprised of headcount. And so that strategic decision about what it takes to bringing the company safely to the other side of this high interest rate storm uh, is really the crux of what's happening. And that strategic decision is made at the executive team and as you imagine, it's very much a small type process because you, know, you don't want to be in a position where you're unnecessarily scaring people if you're not going to conduct a retrenchment exercise versus if you do, then you want to do that with the right practitioners and the right practice and the right professionalism. It sounds like you want to protect shareholder value or at least continue to be able to build shareholder value. Uh, are there any other reasons why tech companies are seen to be so much more affected than others? So technology companies are very much like you know, sailing boats in the old ages. And so when interest rates were low, uh, it was very much a tailwind. It was pushing these ships. And so technology startups were able to sail very fast for the past 10 years uh, in a row. Uh, and as a result, we've seen billion-dollar companies uh, kind of sail all the way to the top. Um, and as a result, I think people have been very excited to join these companies because it has always been good times for the past 10 years. Unfortunately, due to the macroeconomics uh, of the sectors that we have today, interest rates have gone much higher due to inflation. And more importantly, even though we expect it to slow in terms of the hikes, uh, it may stay flat or at this high level mm -hmm. for several more years. And so with this, as a result, Imagine now the headwind has become a headwind. Macroeconomics yeah. aside, we've also read reports that some companies actually retrench workers ahead of an IPO launch to make their financials look more attractive to investors. How common is this? Again, when interest rates were low, uh, the public markets were much more forgiving of companies that were burning so they were not profitable because they were able to have that patience to say that we believe that these companies will become profitable in several years in public markets. And so historically, there were not retrenchment exercises that were done before the IPO. But now, because the public markets are very much more impatient for profitability as they list, so executive teams have to make a decision to conduct retrenchment exercises as part of the overall cost-cutting process mm. in order to reach profitability so as to be able to have a successful launch on the public market. Would you say that that's not all, retrenchments are not always the last resort in this case, particularly in this case? For technology companies, a large percentage of their budget will be people, uh, which is, I think, different from other traditional industries, for example, oil and gas and those with 
a lot of capital assets. Mm. And so that's always going to be one of the larger levers that's going to be available for the executive team to make a decision. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to trim some fat, so to speak, mm. that's the obvious place mm. uh, that you are going to uh, hands on. Uh, Karen, yes. hearing that, how does that make you feel? Uh, I think for my case, my company was quite uh, irresponsible. It felt like they took advantage of the loophole in the MOM uh, laws, whereby if a uh, worker work less than two years, they don't have to compensate at all. So I actually work less than a year, and all the people that came in with me all got laid off together. And I felt that we were unfairly laid off, not because of our performance, but because there was no need for compensation. So we were the cheapest to lay off. I want to ask uh, Grace very quickly, did you get any retrenchment benefits? No, I didn't get uh, benefits, so to speak but I get uh, to serve two months' notice, which I guess it's um, kind of the benefit that we are offered. Okay, I can't see how your notice period is considered a benefit, but the reason why you were not given retrenchment benefits, what was it? Uh, it was because we were asked to choose between uh, resignation or, um, or retrenchment. And at that point of time, given that two choices, I chose uh, resign instead of uh, re being retrenched. Did you ask if you were entitled to benefits, retrenchment benefits? Um, I did ask, but my company was quite small and uh, the, we were facing some financial issues. So being like, uh, I wanted to be an understanding worker as well and wanted to genuinely support the company. So I didn't try to push anything that would um, like, you know, not benefit them. Got it. Um, now let's take a look at the experience of Lionel, whom we saw earlier in the show. It was quite shocking. I didn't know how to react. You know, I didn't know what to feel because I wasn't informed that the retrenchment exercise was going on. There was no signs or any clue. They were sent an HR invite and asked to attend the meeting. When I attended it, I realised that this is actually a retrenchment exercise. I would have thought that we would at least be informed before the actual retrenchment. There was no transparency. John, I'm going to come to you now. In the three profiles that we have heard so far, very little lead time was given to the retrenched workers. How much lead time is normally given ahead, before a retrenchment exercise? Generally, when a company has decided to do a retrenchment, it could potentially take as short as one week to a month to plan the retrenchment exercise. Just, just imagine, right, when you're a retrenchment exercise, a responsible company has to look into which are the positions that will be impacted, two is that which are the benefits that we are be able to ensure that the impacted receive, and three, what will be said to the impacted, and last but not least, right, what will be the messaging to the rest of the companies, right, and the people who stay with the company. When they say that it's last minute, it's truly from the uh, angers that because they weren't informed in advance, and typically company keep it very, very um, quiet about the thing because they don't want to actually rattle the rest of the company or affect the reputation. And that's where, right, typically that is sort of come as a surprise to the impacted employee, like a last minute. It sounds like all this is due to protect, all this is done is to protect the interests of the company versus the interests of the employees. Grace, is this something you agree with? Yes, to some extent that uh, it benefits the company more. But in my personal case, I, I think the, the founder and the company was genuinely trying to help out as much as they could. So You, yeah. you were given very little notice uh, when you were given the news. Take me to the day. What happened? Um, so that day, we were all being called to, uh, to meet up with the founder. So each of us were given like 15 minutes time slot. And uh, he talked to us one by one. Mine was like the second one that was being called. Mm -hmm. But I, after the first person left the office, we knew right away that that person basically told the rest of us that she was getting laid off as well. So we knew right away that that was a retrenchment exercise. Mm -hmm. yeah. You still look a bit emotional when you talk about it. Does it still hurt? I mean, of course. Um, it was, um, I, 
it was quite quite a low point for me, especially last year. Uh, this year, I'm so much better because I'm able to talk about it and really share about it on social media. Thank you for that. We'll <laughs> pick it up right after this commercial break. Coming up, we review what really goes on behind closed doors before the X falls on the employees. Welcome back. We've been talking about the emotional toll on workers who are affected by layoffs. We are joined in this segment by another industry insider who has intimate knowledge of how companies carry out layoffs. Uh, Matthias, we've heard Grace and Karen talk about how it was really, really sudden when the termination notice came. Is there a secret strategy to how companies time these announcements? Mm. So thanks, Diana. I think in my experience, there is no hard and fast rule when companies do uh, make these announcements, it really is a function of how prepared the HR teams and possibly the legal teams are in making sure that the employees who will be affected have their, um, their due payments, make sure that uh, they're paid what they do. John, let's go to you now. Uh, tell me about how companies time these announcements. I mean, we've heard some scary stories about how people are even uh, told about their retrenchment in the middle of a holiday. Tell me more. Yeah, it's very unfortunate. So even if it's not in the middle of holiday, when Matthias says that it all depends on how prepared the companies and the HR is, often than not, sometimes the HR and the company left it to the last day of the week, which is a Friday. Now imagine that if you were to notify that on a Friday, you are leaving the impacted employee without any support on the weekend. And on the weekend, some of the impacted employee feel too ashamed or embarrassed to even sort of tell their family member because it may be a stigma that they felt as a result, no support. When you talk about support, John, exactly what kind of support are you talking about? Now, just imagine if you're impacted. This is where it's, it's, it's a very emotional draining process that they are going through, right? They, they were thinking as to what do I do next? Uh, where can I find a job? What about my family? So there's a lot of questions that every individual will go through based on the circumstances. When I talk about support, right, as much as possible, a responsible company in HR want to ensure that they are there to answer as much questions as possible, help them through the transitions, right, so that they know that they're going to be life and hope beyond the retrenchment. Mm. Clearly not all companies do that. We wish they did, but they don't. What sorts of uh, nasty practices, if you like, have you heard of in terms of timing the announcements? Like what I say is right, apart from the Friday, mm. this is where some companies may have planned it during December. And when, when the Jeremy said that often and not, it's about how much cost they need to cut, the nasty things in this case, I would say that they will jump on the opportunity to inform them at the start of the year like 2nd of January, just mm. imagine the employee came back and they were notified that they were laid off. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, retrenching someone is like breaking up. There really is no good time to do this. But how can we avoid the bad times? Matthias, I know that you think that Friday is not such a bad idea. Tell me why. Uh, yes, I think one perspective is that you do let the affected employees have the weekend off, so to speak, so they don't have to come back to the office the day after and face their colleagues and explain to them what happened. Um, you do want them to have some downtime to process the information. So I think on that, from that perspective, letting the news out on a Friday does make sense. OK, um, let's move on now to contracts. Matthias, I know that you've helped companies to draft some retrenchment contracts. We managed to get hold of some contracts. Let me highlight some of the clauses. Employees may have to sign contracts which say they cannot disparage or say anything negative about the company. There is also the non-compete clause which prohibits the employee from working, on, uh, working with another company which competes with the business of the employer for up to six months. Matthias, the non-compete clauses, even during my time, decades yeah. ago, we see that. But what is this non-disparage clause? Yes, so if we're talking about the non-competition clause, it's really a clause um, that is exceptional in that it continues to bind the, em the employee after... Tell me about the non-disparage clause. Sure. The non-disparagement clause is, prevents the employee from um, saying anything or doing anything that puts the former employer in a negative light. So the purpose for that really is um, to protect the interests of the employer in making sure that the 
disgruntled, presumably employee who is out in the market looking for new employment opportunities, does not go on and um, say nasty stuff about the time at the previous employer. Okay, John, let's go to you to talk about the NDA, the non-disclosure uh, clause. What are your thoughts about that? When it comes to the non-disclosure, right, it's very important that the company wanted to protect any um, unnecessary divulge of the uh, company operations. When you actually asked about my thought, I wanted to also share that NDA is also signed when an employee actually accepted the offer when they first joined the company. It's not only signed when they actually are separated. Right now, let's take a look at what Lionel has to say about the contract he signed. I have to sign a separation contract, which includes the terms of the retrenchment, the benefits of the retrenchment, as well as the NDA, which prohibits us to speak about the retrenchment. Karen, I want to ask you, you signed the NDA as well. How did that make you feel? Uh, yes. I felt like I was forced to sign the NDA, meaning I don't really have a choice because I did ask, what if I don't sign? And then the HR just said, if you don't sign, then you don't get anything. Um, it's kind of ironical because technically I was less than two years, so I don't really get much. But at the same time, I felt very um, stressed and I, that I had to sign it. And then at the same time, I also asked them, what about the competitive clause, if it's still held on? And uh, the HR to that said yes. Were so, you given sufficient time to sign the NDA? I, I wouldn't say end of the day is a sufficient time, mm. to be honest. Okay. Yeah. Matthias, can I come to you? I noticed that a lot of these contracts that we have come across, the language is very, very broad. Is that intentionally so? Yes, it's uh, usually a function of the lawyers who drafted those clauses to make sure that they protect the employers in um, the furthest way possible. Yeah, that's the short answer. Okay. But guys, can an employee choose not to sign? Yes, the employee can choose not to sign, but to do so would presumably risk all the sort of payments that the company has promised if the employee were to sign the contract. So a lot of these, sometimes what's at stake are ex gratia payments, mm -hmm. uh, potentially retrenchment benefits as well. So all these would be up in the air if the employee chooses not to sign. Yeah, so basically you're put between, between a rock and a hard place. If you don't sign, you're not going to get your benefits or, or any benefits at all. Yes, uh, that's the unfortunate reality. It is the unfortunate, unfair reality, would you say? Well, there are guidelines which the MOM has promulgated to encourage companies to uh, pay certain amounts of severance to, uh, at least the guiding principle is between is about a month uh, for each completed year of service uh, that retrenched employees should be entitled to. Uh, but these are guidelines, and if companies don't comply with the guidelines, then there could be, and when we'll usually take action. Let me pick up on that, yes. perhaps uh, in the next segment. But Karen, for now, can I come back to you uh, with regards uh, to the NDA? How did, you, how did you feel when you put your name on the dotted line when you signed it? I feel silenced because it was so sudden and I felt very shocked. I feel like anger and everything and I cannot share with anyone. Yeah, so I really felt that I didn't have a voice and I didn't have a say in it. And telling me that it was not my fault didn't make it any better. It made me feel angrier because um, I know it wasn't my fault. So definitely it was the company's fault. And you telling me doesn't make me feel any better and you don't compensate me. So. What is the whole point? Yeah, that's how I felt. Mm. I thank you for not keeping silent and speaking your mind on this show. John, can I come to you and ask you, is there anything an employee can do? Can we negotiate the retrenchment contract, for example? The employee cannot negotiate. But one thing that the employee may know is that typically when it comes to the payout, there are two parts. One is actually called the retrenchment benefit. And the other part, if it's on top of that, could be called the will. Now, typically, companies right, will not pay you the goodwill if you don't sign. But company cannot actually um, not give you the retrenchment benefits right, in this exercise. Okay. Uh, we uh, got to move on now. Matthias, let's go up. Tell me what goes on behind closed doors when a company decides to retrench. Yes. So, by and large, you will have the HR team who will be very much involved in the exercise. Uh, very often, they will work with their in-house legal counsel if they are. Otherwise, external lawyers, might, like myself, will get involved. 
um, we will usually come up with an action plan or a step plan uh, where we decide certain dates, certain things will happen. We'll make sure that all every affected employee's contractual entitlements are uh, very carefully scrutinised and reviewed. Mm -hmm. If there are collective uh, agreements, those will also have to be looked into. Mm -hmm. But what you have are a very a team of people coming together to make sure that the exercise is done, ideally, in a way that's legally compliant. Mm. Jeremy, uh, you run businesses, you invest in businesses. What Mathayo has said, at what point do you consider the well-being of the retrenched employee? At what point? Does it even appear on the radar? It does appear on the radar because there's an the expectation of professionalism that we expect of every executive in every business transaction they do on a day-to-day -day basis as well as how they treat employees who are coming in, who are in the company on the way out. The truth is, there is a storm. And so the captain of the ship has to make a decision because the ship um, has to have the cargo, but also has the remaining employees who will also be on that team as well. So that being said, just because of the storm doesn't mean that you throw people overboard. It means that you have to offload them at the nearest port in a professional way. And so from an investor perspective, it's really important uh, that we work with the executive team because the remaining team has to feel that the people who have departed have been treated fairly, otherwise their morale will be low. And number two is if the company has brought on a reputation of being a bad employer, mm. then how would it be expected when the storm is over to bring on the next wave of talent that will help would, them? Would that? you invest in a company that practices unfair or irresponsible retrenchment practices? Would you invest? I think the fundamental reality is that uh, an unfair practice is reflective of how the executive team is thinking and approaching the business. And uh, the fact is that business is an iterative uh, dimension across multiple years. And so I think a management team that does not take care of their employees on the way out uh, is a difficult team to be investing in. I take that as a no. Oh, never say never. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's move on to um, Karen and Grace. Uh, both of you are fairly young. Yeah. Did you expect uh, to be retrenched? Karen? Definitely not, because I didn't join for very long in that company. And uh, it's just very sudden when they told me that mm. I was retrenched. Uh, I thought that I was in for a long time. La. And mm. to be honest, I felt very regretful that I didn't choose other uh, companies. Karen, I know that you are young. Mm. What kinds of financial commitments do you have? Um, so I'm actually married and I do have uh, housing loans. And uh, for the role, I also took on commitments like phone uh, bills and uh, yeah, they just don't stop when the contract ends. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I want to ask you because I have young children, well, young children who eventually grow up and get take a job like you. Did you ever feel cheated because when you were young, mommy and daddy tell you to study hard and then you will get a good job. No one ever told you about retrenchment. Yeah, definitely. No one told me that uh, if you get retrenched because you work less than two years, you don't get compensation. Yeah, mm. I didn't know that I wasn't protected at all by the MOM laws. Grace, you are Singaporean. Uh -huh. uh, do you have any expectations that you should be protected, for example? Because I know you asked very few questions about what you are entitled to. Definitely, there's some areas which are, on hindsight, when I look back, I should have like researched better. Mm -hmm. But my um, goal at that point of time, I, I wanted to um, be good to my employer as well, because I'm trying to think from his point of view as a business, I know that he... <laughs> wasn't being very personal about it. So, mm. yeah, that's my point of view. Hire her. Yeah. <laughs> She's very considerate. Okay. She is. <laughs> John, John, I want to come to you. Uh, we used to think that only older people, or at least people in the mid-careers, they get retrenched. But we are seeing much younger people as well. Why is that so? It's not about the age, right? Because typically, if you look at the layoff, a decision is made about the business. Which are the business they need to sort of... Um, Downside, which are the business that they need to actually shut down. So when it comes to that case, right, if you just look at it from a business point of view, whether you are old or young, right, everybody in that department or team get impacted. Mm. Okay, uh, Matthias, what sorts of roles tend to be at the front lines when it comes to a retrenchment exercise? Yep. I would say typically in my experience, I've seen the more back end roles. So we will call them the the cost centers. 
Yeah, uh, so in every company, we look, usually staff are sorted into the front end, the back end, those who are revenue making. So the typical example would be your people who are out in the streets trying to close sales and close deals, and these people contribute directly to the top line. Mm. Um, so those people, you don't, you want to be very careful with letting them go, because if you let them go, you really risk the sort of revenue streams being cut down and diminished. Mm. Uh, what we see are the people who are back end, people traditionally called cost centers, so uh, people who don't contribute to the top line. So for example, possibly your HR teams, legal teams are not usually spared either, um, in-house finance teams, uh, yeah. Okay. Jeremy, uh, uh, Matthias has talked about the back-end employees and all that. Many of these tend to be females. Do you sense that there is a gender imbalance when it comes to retrenchment? There is, from my observations, no intentional decision there. So what you see companies are doing, for example, they're shutting down entire regions, uh, entire product categories, or conducting uh, departmental layoffs. And so that very much is the direct function of I think what we talked about, which is how do we get to break even? You know, how do we avoid continuing running losses? So I want to get back to the point that Matthias had just mentioned, which is that people who are in sales, for example, if you are contributing to the bottom line, then you are less likely to get hit. But increasingly, we are also hearing stories about high performers, including those from sales, who get axed as well. I can't wrap my head around it. Why? Can anybody? Can anybody tell me? Jeremy. Well, uh, you know, the truth of the matter is that if it's a very big storm and the ship has been, you know, really not been captain well, then everything is on the table, you know, for. And so the truth of the matter is that we talked about earlier, like John said, uh, there's a speed dynamic that's important. There's not everybody has an in-house legal counsel or HR team. And so these decisions are not necessarily always professional, nor is it always well executed, mm. nor is it, you know, the best outcome in the long term. Okay, so there's sales, but there's also cost. Yeah. It, it is so. also possible that the company is having a reorganization or redirection. So they may have decided that certain activities we want to deprioritize. Uh, and so that could affect possibly people who are in the sales functions of those areas of the company, uh, which uh, are going to be less relevant for the company's performance in the future. So that's one plausible explanation I can suggest. Grace, let me ask you, yeah. do you think that you were a high performer? After all, you were offered an increment. Yes, I mean, actually, um, uh, my review before that was very good. So that's why I wasn't expecting it at all. But in my case, the company was undergoing what he said was a restructuring. So instead of hiring people from Singapore, they decided to uh, hire remote workers from other countries to cut the costs. Yeah, and they are only retaining uh, only 20% of the current workers. Okay. Karen, what about yourself? At least according to your appraisal, what were you told? Were you a high performer? For mine, I'm actually in front end. So I do know that I perform well uh, every single month. And actually, it's quite similar to Grace in the sense that they decided to replace us with workers from Malaysia instead because it's much cheaper. All right. Well, with that, we need to take another short break. Coming up, should we get tougher on our retrenchment law? Stay with us. How do employees' rights to retrenchment benefits compare elsewhere? Well, Thailand implemented a new Labour Protection Act in 2019. Companies are required to inform the government 60 days before a retrenchment exercise. In Singapore, it's within five days after. In Thailand and South Korea, the minimum advance notice employers must give to workers is one month. In the US, it's two months. This statutory minimum is much lower in Singapore between one day and four weeks. In Thailand and South Korea, severance pay is also written into law. Here in Singapore, there is no such statutory requirement. And you've just seen examples of how some countries deal with retrenchments. Joining us for the segment is the Executive Director of the Singapore National Employers Federation, a body that covers 3,500 members, including MNCs. Gim Guan, welcome. Uh, we've seen what happened in Lazada, and Lazada is also a SNAF member as well. In the absence of tougher laws, retrenchment laws, what can SNAF do to encourage more employers to do the right thing when it comes to retrenchment? So to Together with our tripartite partners, uh, we've issued a tripartite advisory. Mm. Uh, what may be true is not all employers may be familiar 
uh, with the advisory where we advise uh, companies in terms of how they will be able to manage excess manpower and as a last resort if they need to retrench, how to do it responsibly. Wait, why aren't they familiar? It's not surprising that uh, in many companies, especially the smaller companies, uh, they don't have a full-time HR function. Mm. So the one individual may be dealing with many different issues and depending on the priority of the day, uh, they may not be focused on all the different things that are happening uh, both within the country as well in terms of the legislation and guidelines that are issued. Mm. Moving forward, what is the most important thing that you think SNAF can do to address this situation? Actually, the most important thing is um, upstream. How do we even prevent retrenchment from happening in the first place? So if you look at the numbers of retrenchment that is happening, uh, 14,000 plus, uh, landscape of total employment about 3 million. Mm. Actually, what you don't see are all the companies that have done all the right things so that retrenchment don't happen. Even when they are facing difficulties or even when they are having to transform because they are helping to bring their workers along, upskilling, reskilling them mm. so that the workers continue to be able to contribute to the success of the company. Mm. When the company does well, I think as Jeremy mentioned earlier, in the earlier days when tech is doing and booming, right? You don't see the company retrenching because they are in a growth spurt. So companies that, don't, that are doing well generally don't retrench. Mm -hmm. And so if we are able to ensure that workers are contributing to the business outcome, then I think that is a more important step to take. Uh, Matthias, I think when I first uh, saw the VT, the, the video for the differences in yes. the various jurisdictions, Singapore laws are clearly less robust. What is one glaring gap for you compared to other markets? Well, I think the, the obvious gap, as we've seen, is that it, in Singapore, it is not hard-coded law. The obligation on the employee to pay out a certain amount for each completed year of service. Right now, that has the effect of a guideline, right? And if a company, should a company fail to adhere to those guidelines, MOM will intervene, as well as the rest of the tripartite partners, as we've seen in the news with the recent retrenchment. So mm. if something should be hard-coded into law, mm. um, I suspect that might be one area they were relevant. Can I ask very into. quickly, they may be just guidelines, yes. but will the courts refer to these guidelines? Uh, yes, we have seen Singapore courts refer to not just these guidelines, but other guidelines, a number of the ones that the uh, ministry has promulgated. Those have been seriously uh, considered by the courts when they do adjudicate on employment cases. Yes. Okay, so it's usually after the fact when there is a dispute, and then it goes to, the case goes to court, and then the courts refer to these guidelines. Yes, such as those on unfair dismissal, if I can okay. cite an example. Okay. So uh, I was about to say that um, sometimes when the company is in financial difficulty, uh, it is actually important for us to recognise that if we hard code, uh, for example, the amount of retrenchment that has to be paid, then there could be a negative impact on the employees that the company can retain. Because if they are already in financial difficulty and you are demanding that they have to pay a certain amount of retrenchment, Got it. Yes. Uh, then they won't have enough to um, keep the business going which means they may have to even retrench more people. Yes, yes. I, so, uh, uh, thank you for that. I mean, in a way, in a very perverse sort of way, we kind of need to uh, hire people first before we can fire them. <laughs> we no, I think we need to make sure jobs. that we look at things uh, in context. Yeah. Got it. Karen and Grace, this question is for you. We've been talking about rights, so fill in the blanks for me. As, as someone who, uh, if I am retrenched, this is my question, if I am retrenched, I want the right to fill in the blanks for me. Karen, let's come to you first. I want the right to do what? I want the right to have a minimum compensation, mm. even if I'm less than two years. Yeah. Okay. I think compensation is the most important part that was not in uh, the document that I signed. Mm. Well, Kim Kwan, what do you think of, of her suggestion, what she's just said? So actually, the Trapada guidelines, even though the law says that uh, you need to be at least two years in service uh, mm. to be eligible for retrenchment benefit, uh, actually the guidelines suggest to employers that even for employees that have less than two years of service, uh, give some kind of payment. Mm. Grace, did uh, you get any? You didn't get any pay payment. I think you've told us that yes. uh, the company didn't offer because you were less than two years. Yes, uh, so all of us, instead of a uh, payment, we get to serve two months' notice. Uh, yeah, so we still have to work for the next two months. That was kind of, uh, in their term, is the benefit that we are getting. 
Yes. Okay. Uh, let fill in the blanks for me, Grace. The mm. same question that I asked Karen earlier on. If I'm retrenched, I want the right to do what? I think my answer would be quite similar to Karen. Like I want the right to kind of um, know more about like what my rights are and mm. get uh, access to kind of like a minimum amount of wage that I can receive a, a as compensation. A that is very tough because as individuals, we hardly have any access to legal counsel. Uh, so, uh, I mean, there's much to be said about the playing field. Kim Kwan, I'm just curious about one point because uh, below two years, the, or the employer is really goodwill. Lah if you want to compensate or not. I'm just curious not to compensate. What might be the reasons? It could well be because of uh, financial difficulties. Uh, generally, that is the reason mm. uh, in terms of their affordability. Okay. Uh, question is for the three uh, gentlemen here. Uh, we know that moving forward, we are expecting to see more retrenchments in 2024. What are the trends like? Which sectors are we seeing from? Uh, which sectors should be more careful? Jeremy. So... Interest rates uh, have been high and will continue to stay high for the foreseeable future for at least one to two years. And so I think technology as a sector will continue to be highly impacted by this mm -hmm. because you know the profitability, the path to that is so far away. Mm -hmm. And so I think the worst is over, I would say, but I think there will still be some... Are you saying the worst is over for the tech sector? I would say that we're at the bottom. I think mm -hmm. everybody who has had to cut mm -hmm. has cut. Uh, and those who are not yet cutting are... Well, you know, I think the writing is on a wall, both internally. Gim Guan, beyond tech, what sectors? Actually, it's going to be quite difficult to predict, uh, partly because, for one, in terms of disruption, right, you can see technology disruption don't just disrupt the tech sector, it can disrupt many other sectors. Mm. And I think the question of the disruption impacting competitiveness and therefore impacting business uh, sustainability. Amongst your members, you have many different sectors. What's your sense of what's happening on the ground? Which sectors are likely to be impacted? The ones that are facing biggest issue now uh, are really relating to cost, right? Uh, and the cost uh, borrowing, uh, cost of uh, transport, uh, supply chain uh, costs, uh, as well as, of course, which cost. So with all these different factors coming in, I, I would say that in general, mm. the pressure is quite equal across all sectors. Everybody is going yeah, to get but hit. But of course, even in sectors that are doing well, there are mm. companies that don't do well, mm. right? So I, I wouldn't zoom in on any mm. particular Matthias, sector. what's your take? Which I'm, sectors are likely to get hit? I'm with Gim Guan on this. I think the tech sector, definitely, because a lot of the big tech giants went on a massive hiring spree during the COVID period. Now they've realised that a lot of the targets that they wanted to hit for themselves um, were, not, mm. were not actually hit. Mm. Uh, but I do think, I mean, if you look at recent data, you see that even non-tech firms have had to retrench a lot of workers. Any so, sectors in mind? Um, I mean, there's FMCG, there are even financial sectors, mm. banking institutions, we've seen let go of people. Okay. So, well, it's, it sounds to me like no one, everyone needs to be careful around this time. I want to ask you, what is the one thing that workers can do better now to protect their jobs? Uh, Jeremy, let's start with you. The one thing that workers can do. Uh, I would definitely say uh, take advantage of the opportunity to reskill uh, as much as possible. So stay on top of your skills, uh, be open to new employers, and also be open to exploring and training for new industries. New so, industries. Gim Guan, what's your take? Same answer. Employability, right? How do you ensure that you are resilient mm -hmm. uh, by making sure that you continue to upskill and reskill? Uh, perhaps look out for what are the new things that are coming, right? Sustainability, obviously, is a new area that is quite important. Mm -hmm. So if there is an area of interest, pivot there. I think it can't go wrong. Growing sectors. Matthias, very quickly. Same please. answer. Upskilling. I mean, mm. the government has given everybody a top-up of skills future credit. So I think I would say you put that to good use. Um, be creative and talk to people and network. Okay, well, be creative. Karen, I want to come to you. Would you work for a tech company again? No. I have that competitive clause. A lot of tech companies know how to take advantage of that two-year uh, loophole that MOM did not force enforce on them. So it's just a guideline to them. It's like, just, just a guideline. Oh. There's no punishment. How are you making yourself more employable? For me, I tried to reduce my salary, I would say. So you're willing to take a pay cut, is that yes. what you're saying? Yes. Okay, we wish you the very best, Karen. And Grace, what about yourself? Are you finding another job? Have you found one? No, I'm actually not looking for a new job as uh, the experience of retrenchment actually got me thinking of what I really want to do in life. And because of that, I decided to start my own uh, business, which is a social media agency. 
and it, it turns out to be a blessing in disguise, the whole retrenchment thing. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. She's thinking of the bulk. She's pivoting and being creative. Well, on that note, uh, we thank you uh, all for coming uh, and, and also Karen and Grace for sharing your stories. Uh, to, for those of you who are affected or who want to be prepared for the wave of retrenchment, we hope that we have provided you with some clarity and comfort. Thank you and good night.